Hello everybody, I'm Gary Kitchens and I'm going to talk to you about Viable Systems Model. First, what is a viable system? Well, viability is the ability of a thing to maintain itself or recover its potentialities, whence viable system, where a system is a complex organised whole or body of material or immaterial things or similar. A viable systems model is a scientific model of the organisation of a viable or autonomous system. First, this word system. We describe all sorts of things as systems. Are we always right? Or perhaps could we be using the wrong term? For example, if you think about an aircraft, it has propulsion, flight controls, undercarriage, navigation, radar and radios, etc. Until the 1980s, these were called equipments because they equipped the aircrew with essential facilities. Now the term system was introduced, perhaps to enhance manufacturer's image, or also to recognise the increasing complexity of artefacts which came in several boxes cables and antennae. A complete set of boxes and cables was rebadged as a system, even when it strictly wasn't a system, that is. Mechanisms and devices for the aircrew, on their own then, are artefacts. Together, the aircrew plus the artefacts that they're using might be called socio-technical subsystems. But such arrangements, being at best subsystems, appear neither viable nor autonomous. But what about a fire-and-forget missile? Once fired, isn't it viable or autonomous, if only briefly? So viable is able to maintain itself, recover its potentialities, and autonomous is acting independently or having the freedom to do so. So what makes a system viable? Well, obviously the ability to maintain itself, to overcome problems, threats and resource shortages, and the ability to recover its potentialities by repair, reconstitution, reversion, relearning. Viable systems have both ways and means to recover without external help, which suggest perhaps significant complexity. Viable versus autonomous. Can a system be viable, yet not autonomous? A neonate or newborn may be viable, that is, able to survive in a supportive, nurturing environment, but a neonate might not be considered autonomous, partly perhaps because it lacks the intelligence to formulate purpose. But it does have the instincts to demand food, to complain of discomfort, which is surely autonomy, if only small scale, and it will surely enhance its capabilities with time. Perhaps viable refers to the capabilities within the system, whereas autonomous refers to the observable independent behaviour of the system without external control. So can a system be autonomous only if it is viable? Hmm. So is a boat, car, plane, tank without a driver a viable system? Or is it instead an artefact? A thing made by human workmanship? On the other hand, a boat, car, plane, tank with a driver seems to make an autonomous system able to act independently. A way to look at it that might be helpful is to say that the vehicle serves the driver's purpose. Its features extend the driver's human capabilities to travel, carry, swim, fly, etc., according to the vehicle type. Together, they make a socio-technical system which may be both viable and autonomous, but with purpose being formulated in the human part. A viable system, then, is able to address and overcome internal problems defects, failures, pathogens. 
and it's able to overcome external threats from the environment, from attacks, etc. To remain viable, an open system may utilise the flux of energy, information and substance that defines an open system. Aspects of viability A viable system is one that can survive to function, perform and even thrive in its natural environment, which may present risks and threats from without and from within. So, essential viable system features, uh, given by the acronym SMESH, are survive. It has to survive external threats. It has to maintain itself against internal threats such as defects and failures. It has to be able to evolve as the environment uh, and even the context change about it. It has to maintain synergy between its parts as they cooperate, coordinate and control. Otherwise, the system will not perform. And homeostasis, it has to maintain dynamic equilibrium such that the internal environment within the system is uh, suitable for its internal systems to function and operate. In facing external threats, a viable system has to possess survivability, which has several aspects. Avoidance of detection, self-defence, damage tolerance, and damage control and repair. Similarly, maintenance requires the ability to detect internal problems, locate, isolate and suppress those problems, repair, excise and replace, and restore prior potentiality, which may involve redundancy, use of backups, reversionary modes of operation, and so on. Then there's evolution, which is adapting to changing environment. And that requires the ability to enhance and re-optimize performance in changing situations and circumstances. Then there's synergy, the interaction or cooperation of two or more organisations or agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. And if that sounds like emergence, that's no accident. Synergy then, it means that all system parts are cooperating, behaving and performing together as a single entity an integrated organised whole, without which obviously the system is not performing at all. And then there's homeostasis, the dynamic equilibrium between interdependent parts of the system. Le Chatelier's principle comes into question here. When, when a constraint is applied to a system in equilibrium, then insofar as it is able, it will adjust itself to oppose the constraint and in so doing we'll move to a new point of equilibrium. For complex systems, humans, ecosystems, the stock market, motorway traffic, etc., connected variety may be the basis for dynamic equilibrium, with many separate interactions creating a multiplicity of interactions and bonds that leads to a robust chaotic stability, which can nonetheless survive for extended periods and can adapt to change. The various elements of SMASH are clearly not in, uh, independent, they are in fact interdependent. Uh, maintenance addresses threats to survival, homeostasis and synergy. Uh, the system will not evolve unless it survives and will not survive long term unless it also evolves. Evolution uh, has to adapt in the face of long-term change and environment, threat and context. And synergy has to maintain the cooperation and coordination control of and between all the parts. So all of these, uh, as, the, as the figure tends to show, are dependent and interdependent and mutually interdependent. 
Going a little further with that, we can see that, for example, maintenance and survival require uh, resources, parts, facilities, connections, fabric and energy. Survival requires perhaps uh, sensory information, intelligence, protection, cover such as armour, weapons and tactics perhaps. Uh, evolution is going to involve energy. Evolution and homeostasis both address problems of change in environment and context, but they work differently. Evolution adapts long term. Homeostasis resists the external change, having an effect on the internal environment in the short term. So the viable systems model one. Notional plan view here at the right shows physical substrate or structure or container in or which the many and various functions of the system uh, will act, react and perform. So we're talking about a substrate, something probably physical on which the functions uh, will perform. In an animal tissue that substrate would be collagen. In an ecosystem that substrate would be the earth uh, on which the plants uh, grow and the air in which the insects and birds and bats fly. Uh, in a vehicle it would be the chassis, in a ship it would be the hull, in a computer it might be the back plane, in an animal it might be its skeleton. So the substrate supports, protects, supports interconnections and interactions between active elements and therefore is a contributor to architecture. The figure also shows functions grouped into functional uh, physical subsystems, which are mutually interdependent and synergistic, which also contributes to architecture. So viability management then is largely concerned with maintaining the functional physical subsystems, their interactions and the substrate. So maintaining a foundation of capability upon which and within which functions act, interact, cooperate, coordinate and control. This is the same picture as you've just seen. It shows the viable system substrate interacting with two other open systems in an operational environment at the top, those concentric circles. This is something of a sandwich and you're looking down on the bottom layer of the sandwich. And the viable system could be, or anything pretty well, a worm, a carnivore hunting prey, a person going to the bank, a fighter aircraft intercepting some hostile target. Because active things have a mission. It could be find food or shelter, travel, create, build a cathedral, hide, follow, evade, shop, etc, etc. And now you see the overlay, which is the second layer on top of the substrate, and this is shown as having primary mission functions, which are those in direct pursuit of mission, achievement, of purpose and goal. And you can see that the primary mission functions uh, are activated through sensor coordination, execution coordination and motor coordination. And there at the centre we can see that the viable system enables function management with the management of mission, resources, viability and behaviour. So we see the model as a top-down sandwich view with a function model overlaying the viable system substrate. Let's have a look at an example of something a, a bit nearer the real world. We look at a, a factory. This particular factory uh, takes in parts, um, assembles them uh, on a, a, through a, a flow line with machines and um, the assembled um, parts become products and they put out to sales. They go into a marketplace where they sell and the proceeds from the sales uh, comes back into the uh, factory as uh, revenue and hopefully 
uh, profit if it exceeds the amount that's been paid out to buy new parts, uh, to buy the machinery and to uh, pay the manpower. So the ovals are interacting functional subsystems of a factory whole. Each is really comprehensible only in the context of the whole thing. It's a typical functional representation, representation of a factory in context, but it has no viable system features. For example, if it was to be survivable, there would need to be some secured premises with safety facilities, reversionary facilities, men and machines, to accommodate failures, fire damage, maintain assembly flow rate and so forth. There would need to be maintenance, the availability of a continu continually trained staff fresh spares, test facilities and so forth. The whole would need to evolve over time and that comes about with marketing staff looking forward to new products and machinery to conceive new flow lines. Synergy would have to be maintained, a secure supply of parts and resources, a managed flow of work through the factory into sales and profit. The continuing supply of trained practice operators supervisors, team leads, etc., to operate, to maintain, to upgrade and replace machines. And of course homeostasis, which in this case might be seen as the continuous flow of parts into assemblies, into products, in a maintained benign environment and on into sales and profit needed to procure more parts so as to maintain the viable system in action. And then we can see some vaguely mathematical ideas, homeostasis uh, uh, comes about if the sum of parts coming in equals the sum of goods going out. And if the sum of parts of people coming in, joining the organisation, equals the sum of people going out, uh, leaving the organisation. And if energy in is energy used plus energy dissipated. And if money in is greater than or equal to money out. If all of these things are met, then perhaps we may have the basis for a viable system. So here's the viable systems model three. We're now looking down on uh, a bit more detail. We have a viable body which provides a functioning baseline system on a structured foundation. We've seen the structured foundation before, S-Mesh, uh, and it manages low-level behaviour and coordination. You can see that it's based on the idea of a sensor, processor, effector regime. It exhibits reflex behaviour, coordination between the parts. They're organised, integrated and interdependent. And then we have intellect at the top, uh, which in this case is mission management and behaviour management. And it adds reasoning, understanding, purpose and mission. Uh, and there is in the middle operations functions, a sense, then process, coordinate effectors and give reflex behaviour. Last is an overview of function management. Mission management in red at the top, resource management in blue at the bottom, and viability management in green in centre, supporting and enabling the other two. Mission and resource management manage the flow and flux of information, energy and substance through the open system. Behaviour management is associated with higher order intelligence, lower order perhaps associated more with instinctive behaviour and reflex. Behaviour is conventionally viewed in either of two ways. The first way is stimulus response. Given a certain stimulus, you expect a particular response. But does a repeated stimulus always produce the same response? Or may the recipient learn and adapt? For instance, if a woman slaps a man, the man may do nothing. If she slaps him again, the man may duck. He may catch her hand. He may even slap her back. 
uh, all of which depends on context and culture. Then another way of looking at it is nature versus nurture. In which case we might ask, is our human behaviour instinctive or learned or both? The following model represents both considered and instinctive or knee-jerk behaviour, since we exhibit humans exhibit both. First you can see nature coming from our evolved backgrounds. Then nurture, which seems to be involved with cognition based on tacit knowledge, world models, belief systems and experience, much of which comes from the environment. And you can see at the left a stimulus coming in and the stimulus goes into an area called or a process called cognition. And out of that comes an interpretation. So the stimulus is something that you might see or hear or feel. And the question is, how well do you identify and recognize that? If you've never met it before at all, you might base your idea of what it is on your beliefs, what you're expecting to be. But it's more likely that you have uh, built up over the periods of your life uh, a library of uh, stimulus recognition features so that you can identify what it is using tacit knowledge, world models and experience, not just belief. Whichever coming out from cognition is an interpretation of the stimulus which may or may not be entirely accurate. That goes into a process called the selection of behaviour and we have behavioural archetypes from nature coming in at the top, experience coming in at the bottom and belief systems telling us if we are going to choose this form of behaviour what we might expect as a response. Then there's motivation, which comes in two forms according to psychologists. Achievement motivation, trying to do your best, and conformance motivation, trying to fit in. Two different kinds of motivation, but they're both motivations. And then there's excitation, where we take the selected behaviour and we give it some uh, a degree of uh, intensity. Uh, to produce a response. So here we see going at the left stimulus coming in, going through cognition, selection and excitation and going out as response at the right. At the same time we see nature at the top and nurture at the bottom left. And then there are these two things, nature and belief system. Nature looks a bit like this in humans according to uh, Carl Gustav Jung we have a collective unconscious with instinct and these uh, behavioural archetypes. Uh, then we have a libido which accounts for our aggression, that's more assertiveness than um, physical, uh, and our energy. And we have character and emotion. Then we come to belief system, which is really quite complicated with beliefs, roles, stereotypes, categories, values, ethics, morals, ideologies and training. I've added in narratives under ideology since they are uh, a current obsession uh, with psychologists and uh, newscasters. So the belief system has got all sorts of things in it which give you a, a view of the world so that you can understand complex problems and find uh, conveniently easy or simple solutions rather than be overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem. You can, as a result, come up with some very strange um, ideas on behaviour and how you should behave and what, what's actually happening in the world. But luckily, uh, all of that can be somewhat overcome by training. You can be trained to behave in a particular way in response to a particular stimulus. And this, of course, is how um, soldiers, sailors and airmen are... are uh, um, trained to defend themselves in the face of attack rather than run away. Training is a powerful way of overcoming all of these other somewhat questionable um, uh, 
features that you find within belief systems. So stimuli are interpreted in the light of prior knowledge and they may be misinterpreted, leading to potentially false decisions and responses. Nature invokes a rapid knee-jerk response and that's part of our uh, inheritance and it's always been necessary for our survival. If you don't respond rapidly, you may not have the chance to respond at all. Uh, uh, but the knee-jerk may be suppressed by a more considered view one we have learnt about. And with any luck that can happen before the knee jerk actually occurs. Belief systems are complex with ethics and morals vying with ideologies and narratives. Potentially invoking prejudiced, unreasoned, ideologically based, based behaviours. Retraining and indoctrination can overcome or suppress quotes inappropriate belief. Trainees may learn to conform to behavioural norms, um, by which I mean norms appropriate to maintain the viable system. And as an example, something perhaps to look up if you don't know about it, you can see what happened to the nuclear plant operators as part of the Three Mile Island accident of the 1970s. Three Mile Island was a nuclear power plant generator. Behaviour and autonomy. Viable systems come in many forms. Natural self-organising systems, flora, fauna, worms, carnivores, etc. And man machine systems, vehicles, weapon systems, manufacturing. Some act instinctively with reflex behaviour. Others exhibit self-awareness and learning and complex behaviours. Robotic machines can be autonomous or part-time autonomous. For example, Curiosity, roaming about on Mars, is autonomous, but is also remotely reprogrammable. And then some are autonomous for part of their mission, but are recovered to human operator control for other parts. For example, the, you know, the unmanned air vehicle uh, Reaper. Fully autonomous machines are controversial, especially those able to conceive, design and create new generations of autonomous offspring. Designers are creating more capable robots. Uh, RPVs, that's remotely piloted vehicles, robot waiters, nurses, driverless trains, robot taxis, autonomous peace officers, surgeons. Such autonomous systems make decisions, choose between options. But are they really autonomous or is their independence very strictly limited? And should they be imbued with ethics and morals? And if so, whose? And I refer you to Isaac Asimov's iRobot for the pitfalls of providing safety rules within robots. Here you can see the viable system model in action. And this is a Simple model of two autonomous systems engaged in combat or competition. Uh, they're called red and blue. They're both viable and they're drawing from resources from the outside the operational environment to exchange, exchange tended action. So they're, they're viable, but they can run out of resources. So they have to be resupplied. Uh, there's a flux of energy, information and substance material thrown through both open systems as each seeks information about the others, their joint environment, threats, risks and opportunities. Each has sensors and effectors and the whole gives you a model which might be the basis for a dynamic simulation. The idea of turnkey is interesting. Customers want, may want or expect a turnkey solution to their problem. That is a complete viable system solution ready to hit the ground running upon delivery and commissioning uh, and probably designed by the contractor. So he's responsible for it legally uh, and intellectually. Anyway, such a complete viable system solution usually comprises the operational system with all that goes in it, 
technology, hardware, software, built-in test equipment, trained operators and engineers. It also usually involves a mission support system, which supports the operational system, might be physically within it, but it might be a separate facility. Uh, and that provides planning and tactics, may, may include mission-specific payload selection. So, for example, specific radars and specific weapons to uh, engage in specific targets. Simulators and part-task trainers facilities, publications, training schools for operators. Then there's a support system. This is the engineering part of the game with servicing mechanics and equipment, test and repair facilities and equipment, automatic test equipment, manual test equipment, etc. Uh, trained technicians, mechanics and engineering managers, mission specific payload provision, secure consumables and spares supply system. And there would be a training school for mechanics, technicians and publications. Uh, that would be uh, housing for management, trainers, training facilities, workshops, test benches, etc. And thirdly, there would be an upgrade system, known in some quarters as post-design services. But this is involved with performance monitoring of the, particularly of the operational system, problem investigation, modification design and implementation, Continual system redesign of the whole solution to match developing and evolving context and environment and planning and implementation of upgrades. So that the system is continually redesigning all of itself so that it um, stays optimal, optimal in terms of performance and availability uh, as, the, uh, as the operational system uh, ages and as the environment adapts and changes. Here's how it might look. You can see a mission system at the top, which does the business. And you can see an operator and user support and engineering support, which ensure a supply of fully trained operators and keep all the technology in good order. And then you can see at the bottom, post-design services, performance in mon monitoring, etc., which improves, develops and evolves the whole. And they all depend upon each other. So they actually themselves are the whole turnkey solution system all together. So viable systems are invariably complex. They require many interactive features to maintain potentialities. For example, a human has 12 organ systems, whereas the the uh, in intellect, uh, the formulation of purpose and pursuit of goal, takes place in only one small part of one of the twelve, the central nervous system, in the part we call the brain. Systems engineering creates whole solutions to customers' problems, so turnkey systems, also known as viable autonomous systems, able to perform in hostile alien environments. And complete infrastructure, IT and transportation systems, air traffic management, emergency services, intelligent buildings, hospitals and prisons. That sort of rather complex thing. Hence, systems engineering is often seen as problem solving and uh, as managing significant complexity. Thank you for listening. Bye bye.